Hi, hello, welcome to this session. So, you want to run Windows workloads on OpenStack? I'm Miklos Karin. I work at Halasoft as an IT director, and I have been a Microsoft MVP for the last 10 years. So, let's start. The agenda for this session, uh, first let's talk about a little about us, our environment, then let's see the options that we have to run Microsoft Windows and OpenStack. We will focus on notice from the field here. Then uh, how to create Windows images on OpenStack and the drivers and configuration. Let's take all the consideration that we need to have over there. Then let's switch to the best practice on how to configure instant using Horizon, but focus on the users. Okay, the users are the one that is the main principal character over here. And then let's go to the Windows instance, check that you are not having problems, what you need to do, monitor, and then we will see all the features running on, on Windows and OpenStack, okay? So uh, about us, we have an OpenStack environment in production running since 2016. We started testing and learning about OpenStack previously, but uh, production ready with Mitaka, we started that year, and our main focus of the company is software development. So all our users are software developers. That's the big challenge that we have here. We started hosting Linux environments because everything was running over there. Very few Windows workloads. However, due to COVID-19, the Windows workloads right now are the main workloads in our cloud. We are talking about 70% versus 30% of the Linux. So you can see that mostly are Windows right now workloads that are running over there. And why? Because the way they, oh, that everything is virtualized in the BDI and so on, we are using OpenStack for it. Anyway, architecture. Let's put our rack server over there. And it's just symbolic what we are showing over there, but we'll give you an idea that we have our infrastructure that is running in one of the servers. And then we have another reserved server that is just for the OpenStack controller nodes. We have all the OpenStack infrastructure running in containers, in databases, Keystone, Horizon, Heat, Glance, I mean, you name it, it's over there. And then we have the compute and the storage nodes, the Nova Compute, Neutral Agent, and the Ceph4C. Yes, we are running Ceph in our environment, and it's everything running over there. So that's a quick view of how our architecture is is going to be. And over there, we run Windows and OpenStack. So when you say, okay, I will run Windows, you have two options. I mean, two. Because one is I will use this already hypervisor VMware, Hyper-V, any other bare metal hypervisor. You can do it because OpenStack will allow to do it. But also you can say, say I, I will run in the Kibia. Okay, both are a uh, solution that you can choose. So let's go to the first one. If you go to the Hyper-V, because if you are running Windows, you will run more, more natively in the Hyper-V. You will know how to run the drivers and everything, so you can do it. Yeah, you have the link over there to configure is required to run Nova Compute and the neutral Hyper-V agent and you are done. You will be able to run the Windows workloads over there. But also you can run the Ender KVM because KVM supports Windows, so it's not a big deal. But there are other considerations that you need to be focused on. And maybe uh, why we are running under KVM and not in the hypervisor, because all our servers were running Linux in the beginning. And then we need, uh, I mean, since we were running Ceph, it was not possible to run the hypervisor, uh, the Hyper-V, and then connect it to Ceph. There is no way. So we need to choose to run under KVM. And if you're running on the KVM, you will face with the nested problem because you need to run one, if you need to run one uh, virtual machine inside other virtual machine, and then what? But say, why you need it? Why you want to run a one API bias on another API bias on top of the other in the Windows side, for example? And remember, developers, they use Visual Studio. And in Visual Studio, they have a, an Android, for example, emulator. That Android emulator will run a virtual machine that needs all the capabilities of the hypervisor to virtualize in order to do it. So nested virtualization was an issue. 
However, since we start with Mitaka, we were not, it was not possible to do that because the parameter that we need, that is the CPU model extra flags equal BMX, was not present. It's just since queens that was uh, that appeared that helps to pass uh, to the instance the CPU model, and then we'll be able to do the next virtualization. To do that, there is a link uh, for the configuration. You go to the section nested guest con supporting Nova Conf and the host model to uh, avoid that problem in the future. And then another problem that you can have is unless you have all your environment with just one type of processor, that I don't think so because you add new machines and then they have not the same type of processor as the CPU model. So, um, to avoid that problem on the live migration, because if you have different servers, uh, I mean, different CPUs, you will not be able to live migrate. So you need to enter that parameter that I am pointing over there in that documentation, CPU mode custom, and then you put the different CPU models, EV Bridge, Haswell, blah, blah, and then OpenStack will choose between them which one uh, you can choose as well, which one you want that all the processors behave. Remember that you need to select the less um, the less CPU with features that you have. I mean, if you have a V3, a V4, you need to see that all the V4s need to be uh, behaved as a tree. Yes, you will lose some new functionalities, but you will win the live migration. Unless, of course, you have a very good bunch of machines that runs before, and then you will have the option to run without any problem because you will separate with cells or with regions. Yeah, you, you, you will check that how you want to do it, and then you will not lose that functionality of the new processor. But if you need it and you, don't, and you will put it in the same environment, this is what you need to do. And finally, you need to tell OpenStack that you are running a Windows instance. For that, it's just two parameters, always distro win equal to Windows, you always type equals to Windows. A certain blog talks about it, why it's needed, and um, what problems you can avoid doing that. And really, uh, with those parameters, and we didn't run any problems so far. How to create Windows image and open stack? You can say the procedure, the manual one, you have the link over there. It's an open stack docs, and then you start doing from the beginning. You uh, could put the ISO file, you create the row, and so on, and you have one image. But doing that every month will be very time consuming. Better to have a more automated way. The cloud based project for me, the guys are very good ones. They do very good, they, they Windows side. So they have your GitHub. I extracted that image from them, and what, what they are doing. Um, you will run, I mean, they will run all the disk, apply ISO to disk, create an attendant, inject the drivers, and then start the VM, they will start all the updates, they will install the cloud-based units, and we'll do the sysprep. Once you do that, you can take that, and you will have your golden image, if you need to, to just install the updates month, every month, but, what you will do it later is just that they will destroy that VM that noted that is in the in Hyper-V, and they will resize the partition, resize the disk, convert to target format, cook code, and then compress it, and you will have it ready to put in the image in the open stack. So what is the key, take key takeaway here? Remember that uh, this project, you can customize for your needs. For example, we can install program, we are configuring the windows to behave a little different. For example, the background, some other things in the remote desktop features that are really are pre-configured. So the image is ready to go when they, the users launch the instance. Okay, so remember, you can customize and you can do a lot of things over there. Really a very good project to automate and have the window ready. Drivers and configurations, as well we have the Fedora drivers to put in the windows, you need to. However, those are not uh, 
WHQL sign it, that means Windows Hardware Quality Lab sign it, or Windows Logo Test. Okay, uh, and if you don't have that, you will not have too much problems unless you need support from Microsoft. If you have a production ready machine and you, you're not having those drivers sign it, you don't have any support for it. And to have those sign it, you need to have a Red Hat Enterprise Linux BART IO drivers or the canonical BART UI drivers minimum in order that they can support you and provide the configuration. And, and how I know if I have or don't I have the BART IO drivers certified by Microsoft? Okay, let's take a quick look about it. Look, we have here uh, the Red Hat BART IO driver adapter, for example. We see in properties, driver, and see, it's digital driver by Red Hat. Okay, that's fine. No, it's not fine. It's not Windows certified. If we go to the balloon driver that is for the memory RAM, we can check that that is also Red Hat. And let's jump here to another machine. And here we have the canonical BART IO SCSI driver, and these ones in driver we can see that is Microsoft Windows Hardware Compatibility Publisher. If we go to the balloon drivers as well, check that in the driver side, we have also the a Windows logo test. And then if you have that, you have all the support that needs from Microsoft if needed. And last but not least, the key management, very good in order that you install and have the metrics coming to for the cyclometer for considerations later. The best practice for users to launch instance, uh, what worked for us was to have the windows space and the hard disk with minimum volume size, 20, 25, yeah, that's what windows needs, minimum. If you put larger files, like 100 gigabytes, what happened is that the user will start putting everything in this C drive and then fill it, and then you need to troubleshoot that. If you have with many, very minimum spikes, say, hey, I don't have a space. Say, hey, you need to put a D drive and put your data over there. So if you run out of space in the, in the future or you need another thing, you can recreate very easily. So they understand later, but it's, it really start with a very minimum volume size in order to avoid that problem. <laughs> Talking about avoid, two gigabytes of RAM, please, no. One gigabyte of RAM image, no. Four is the minimum that you should have, okay? Usually two virtual CPU is the minimum for Windows instance. You can say, hey, why? One virtual CPU can be, okay, yes, can be, but what worked for us is to have two virtual CPU, like the minimum for Windows instance. The network needs to be configured and ready for the users, so they don't need to think what uh, the floating IPs or whatever. Please be ready. Always create a volume not ephemeral, it's by default. In the Suri, it's by default, that's a good thing. Flavors, name convention can be easy. So users can identify and say, ah, two gigabytes or four gigabytes of RAM with two virtual CPUs, whatever, and the security group with default ports open. Let's take a quick look about what we are talking about here. For that, uh, well, let's launch an instance. We put an instance name, okay a description, and here you say what we are talking about. You have the image. Let's check out Windows 2018. Creating volume, yes, always create a new volume. Otherwise, we don't want the ephemeral windows here. Volume size, we say that the menu. Delete volume on instant delete. You select no, please choose no, because users will delete their instance, and then you need to somehow recover quickly their job. And that happens, yes. So you will see that it's in, the, in their instance and you will be able to recreate if needed. If the user is more with more skills and open stack, they will be able to buy their own, but it, you have it there. So very good thing. In the flavor, as I told you, you have here the two for air, for example, is two virtual CPUs, four RAM, four for R as well. So it's more easy for them to choose and not just that. When you troubleshoot the problem as well, they are running, it's everything very slow. And you see, hey, you have a, a, a really a very low instance. So uh, with very low resources, I mean. 
Networks already selected for them. They don't need to do anything. Security groups, by default, the ports are open, uh, what they need. CDC 88, 138, 139. That's something that you need to be considered in your environment. And I think that's it. You have everything to run the instance for more easily for the users. And finally, always configure the disk to a certain throughput. That means the IOPS, you need to put a quality of service in order that the users or one user consume all the IOPS needed. When we run Linux instance, we never run this problem. But as soon as more Windows instance run in our environment, we run performance problems. So what we need was to limit the throughput of IOPS that each um, instance can consume. For example, read 3,000 IOPS, write 1,000 IOPS, and in that case, it will not consume all the resources of the cloud. Be very careful with that. I always recommend configure the disk. You have the documentation, so users will not go beyond the limit. And it's not that the users will go, but sometimes some Windows processes maybe can consume it. How to check they will not run any problems? In general, try to have uh, allocate enough RAM. Avoid to get memory paging because that is what causes a lot of performance issues in OpenStack. If you can individually monitor CPU memory, can be very helpful in order to troubleshoot the users later. Environment uh, very important to overall look for trends. For example, the IOPS here. Uh, you can see our trend that it was very minimum beyond 2000 IOPS and then suddenly it grows. You can say, hey, it's not too big, it's 6000 IOPS, but hey, it was not the same trend as before and we were not doing any not, nothing special. I mean, we didn't create any new workloads. So what happened? It, the users somehow, Windows users, started to consume much more. They installed something that they didn't should have and it's causing us problems. If you don't monitor closely that, you can lose control very easily, at least in the Windows side. It can be helpful to monitor the HD space on each instance. It's responsibility of each user, yes, but if you can and, and have some uh, metrics to get how it's going to each instance, it, it can be very helpful. And training users is the key feature in order to avoid more problems on the OpenStack environment and using Windows as well. Uh, and as soon as you got everything, yes, you can get all the new features of Windows running on OpenStack. Let's go over here. For example, we have here the uh, nested virtualization. Oh, I mean, the, for example, here we are running the WSL, the Windows Subsystem Linux. If we uh, the new version, that is the version 2.0. Here we can have the uh, Windows Sandbox running as well. And last but not least, Microsoft Edge can have the new application Guard window running as well. Over here, you can check. Yes. It's the application we are running in the Microsoft Edge. And last but not least, the nested virtualization that we talk about it. We have the Hyper-V. We're running Windows 2016, running inside the uh, virtual machine in Hyper-V, and this machine is running on OpenStack. Very, very good feature, very good. Everything running seamlessly without any problem. And we that just the summary. Remember, if you're running, you need uh, to see if you run under KVM or other happy biosol. If you're running under KVM, check the processors and the parameters. Remember to have the build IO drivers. You can have the Fedora or the Windows Hardware Quality Labs sign it. Remember how is your use case, what you will need. Use an automated platform to build Windows image. Cloud base is very good, but you can choose whatever you want. Keep it simple for users to launch instance. Do not complicate with for the users. Make it simple. And remember, 
configure the hard performance limit for products. I mean the IOPS. Remember that. Train your users and finally monitor and start tuning to fit your use case. That's the more important. Every day you need to say and you will start tuning and have a very good environment for your users. With that, thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you in the future. Bye.